I'm Bongi Lin, Director of the China Power Project and Senior Fellow for Asian Security at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. In this episode of the China Power Podcast, we are discussing China's views of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. After more than two years of war, key questions arise regarding how the Ukraine conflict has impacted China. How has Ukraine changed China's assessment of its own global geopolitical landscape? What are the implications and lessons learned for China from the conflict? Joining us for our discussion today is Dr. Zhao Hai. Dr. Zhao is the Director of International Politics Program at the National Institute for Global Strategy and Research Fellow at the Institute of World Economics and Politics at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Before joining CAS, he was a research fellow at the National Strategy Institute at Tsinghua University. His research interests are Sino-U.S. strategic relations, geopolitics in East Asia, and international security cooperation. Dr. Zhao holds a Ph.D. in international history from the University of Chicago and a master's degree in Asia-Pacific studies from Peking University. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Zhao. Thank you for having me. Let's start with the background of how China views the current situation in Ukraine. From your perspective, what is happening in Ukraine right now? I think right now, sitting in Beijing and looking at the conflict that is going on in Ukraine, we're really deeply worried that this conflict will continue to escalate. To be exact, we're thinking that this is exactly in the process of escalation. Because this war started already two years ago, and lasted two years of the two sides going back and forth. And right now, because of lack of massive support from the West, Ukraine is showing weakness and the Russians are taking advantage on the battleground. However, its speed of moving towards West is still slow because of its flaws in its uh, military command and its weapon systems. So what happened now is that both sides are eager to use more sophisticated weapons And the Ukrainians is asking the West to provide long-range missiles and F-16, like airplane weapons that can reach into deeply into Russian territory. And at the same time, Russians are using bigger bombs and more weapons that can bring massive destructions. And also, outside of Ukraine, there's other sides that other countries may get directly involved, particularly NATO countries. After some NATO countries sign bilateral security agreement with Ukraine, it's more likely that they provide more assistance to Ukraine. And Russia is concerned about this, and they are saying that they might strike a legitimate target if the countries that provide Ukraine weapons that can directly hit Russia. And recently, we also see that the Ukraine is more willingly and has the capability of striking oil fields and uh, transportation centers and urban areas within Russia to balance what they've lost on the battlefield. So all these signs pointing to a higher level, a more intense level of conflict, not only in the battleground, but also outside. So that's why I think the situation is getting more complicated and more dire. And that's why China is showing more willingness to intervene and try to bring both sides to the negotiation table. In terms of external involvement, you mentioned NATO and its support for Ukraine. Could you talk a little bit about what you see as support for Russia? Obviously, we're seeing a lot of news coverage of support Russia is receiving from Iran and North Korea. Are you also seeing the same in terms of the discussion within China? Well, there's not many discussion about the supply of weapons to Russia because there's no concrete evidence. We've seen from the Western media some reports about, uh, for instance, Iran supplying drones to Russia, uh, various kinds of drones. And also we've seen reports about uh, North Korea supplying munition to Russia. And also some in the United States allege that Chinese companies provided some dual-use items to Russia that can be used on the battleground. However, I think that's besides the point because Russia is very much capable of producing all kinds of weapons that they needed on the battleground. And they have massive capability. And that capability is legacy from the Cold War, from the Soviet Union. And they're reviving their military industrial base. So I think mainly this battle is fought with the Russia stress. And even if Russia gets some outside support, I think that's minimal. That's not going to be a decisive factor for the war in, in Ukraine. 
Thanks for sharing your perspective and a Chinese perspective. We in the United States have a different view of this, and we see Chinese economic support to Russia, including provisions of weapon components as well as dual-use items, and Iran and North Korea's support to Russia as critical in helping Moscow extend its war efforts and also reconstitute its defense industry. I know there are many differences in the U.S. and Chinese position and views on Ukraine. And I want this podcast to focus on how China views the situation and not get bogged down arguing over the differences. So if you don't mind, I'd like to continue this conversation, but get your views on what worries you the most in Ukraine. So when you say you're worried about continued escalation in Ukraine, how far do you think Russia or Ukraine could go or would go? Could you see Ukraine conducting more significant operations aimed at deeper targets within Russia? And on the opposite side, could you see Russia escalating beyond just use of conventional weapons? So China is always worried about humanitarian crisis uh, that is going on in Ukraine. What happens if the two sides escalate is that more and more civilians will be targeted and civilian facilities will be targeted. For instance, the power plants, the oil and gas storage transportation system, and you know, oil refinery and airports, railways, many of those that support civilian life will get more destruction and uh, that will hurt more people and force more people to move out of the country. So I think that's the number one, the harm of the people is the number one concern. And secondly, like what you said, there's always a sword hanging overhead. Uh, that is the use of nuclear weapons. And President Putin even though he said that he's not going to use the uh, nuclear weapons at this point. However, he's always displayed a nuclear capability and try to use that as a deterrence to NATO countries to prevent this fighting from escalating into a total war between Russia and NATO. So I think with further escalation, and we don't know where this is getting us to because when civilians are hurt and some of the terror moves on both sides, like harming civilians, will lead to. And that's something that we need to keep that in mind. Thank you. So now I'd like to transition to discuss the Ukraine conflict's global impact. Let's start with how China perceives how the Ukraine conflict has impacted the global order and international norms. From your perspective, what has changed? Well, I think, first of all, it's a uh, a mistake to talk about the Ukraine just started from two years ago because there is a long history that we can trace back to and attribute some of the reasons to the long-term sort of discomfort and then developed into conflict between the two countries. So I think, you know, in terms of changing of international norms, this conflict only accelerated what's already been there. It's not like this war itself completely and suddenly changed international norms. So let's go back a little bit more into uh, the end of the Cold War. When the United States declared victory and Russia dissolved, there's, I think, a lot of problems remain unsolved. And particularly with NATO as a security alliance remain, and Russia is not fully and properly assimilated into a security structure that will you know, maintain and make sure that long-term European peace and stability, that created a vacuum and created a lot of grievances in Russia. And now, with a lot of things happening on the road, we've seen that uh, President Putin is getting into a point that he worries about his country's ultimate security and the security threats from NATO. And at the same time, Ukraine worried about Russia is going to do something because of their moving more towards the West, particularly joining EU and potentially joining NATO. So this kind of conflict uh, is sort of pushing forward with the world's, what I call a geopoliticization. So already the world is getting into a geopolitical competition between China and the United States. And also globally, there's more emerging countries upsetting the existing international order. With this conflict, it's accelerated the process and throw the world, and particularly international order, into chaos. Because Russia was a big player on global stage, is a UN United Nations Security Council member, is a member of G20, it used to be a member of G8, 
it played a key role in maintaining international order and norms. And now, because Russia finally threw everything under the table and started the military operation in Ukraine, all this is thrown into a very kind of disorder. So we're, I believe, and I think from China's perspective, we believe we're in a stage where the unipolar world, but the United States acting as a hegemon and maintaining the global order into a more multipolar world. However, this world is very bumpy. And right now, we're in this sort of area in between. And it's very unclear how can we move from one structure into another more stable, more prosperous future. So at this point, how the Ukraine conflict then is very important and it's going to be a very important indicator of how the future of the international order will be reconstructed. There's a lot to unpack here, so let me follow up on a couple of items. Going back to the question I had earlier about Russia's relationship with Iran and North Korea, do you think one of the responses that we're seeing from this new emerging order is Russia trying to deepen relations with a number of countries to enhance its security? Is there more desire that we're seeing from Russia to have stronger security partnerships or perhaps even quasi-alliances? I think Russia has put itself into that position where it needs more international supporters and also to withstand the pressure from all those NATO countries and particularly, you know, all those wealthy countries that have much more financial and military resources to have a long-term fight against Russia. So at this point, you know, Russia is, is searching for partners globally. And what you mentioned, Iran and North Korea, maybe many other countries in global south may show some support or some sympathy to Russia's cause. But that does not mean that Russia is trying to organize a comparable security structure and security organization that is in the future, like Warsaw Pact, fighting against NATO in that matter. So I think in the long run, Russia is just trying to reinforce its own capability to continue uh, with this uh, conflict with Ukraine. But that by itself will not change fundamentally the international order. And that international order, I think more importantly, lies with how the West deal with the global South, how the West can share power and build a more fair and open and inclusive international order or international structure. And at this point, I think that it's very unclear and uncertain. Interesting. You also mentioned that how the Ukraine conflict ends will be important in shaping what type of international order will emerge afterwards. Let's unpack this a little bit too. Of course, there are a lot of different ways the conflict could end. But very simply, uh, we could think about one way the conflict ending is where each side consolidates the gains they have made on the ground now. The other is, of course, where we could see a more clear Ukrainian victory, or what we could see is more battlefield gains on Russia's end to be more of a Russian victory. How do you view all these different potential end states, and how might they complicate or have implications for the international order? Yeah, uh, that's a very complicated question. But let's say if we stop the war right now and freeze the front, you will have a Cold War like Eastern European front between Ukraine and other Eastern European countries and Russia. So that's going to consolidate a currently already emerging Cold War like European security structure. Now, putting a large NATO on one side and then a revived, militarized Russia on the other side. And that's going to further bring down the international order and leads to some kind of long-term separation of Russia and the rest of Europe. And already you've seen Russia is executing its policy of looking east and moving its economic center, moving its you know, economic and political activities more towards eastern countries and global south. And that's one uh, possibility. Of course, after the end of the war, probably both sides will seek to recover some of the bilateral relationship, but that's going to be difficult. If Ukraine, for instance, push back Russia to the, let's say, 2022 line or even further, and that will lead to uh, potentially the collapse of the Russian government and some kind of radical change in Russia, I think that's 
that will reinforce NATO and Russia will stop being a very influential actor, for instance, on the global stage. And that's going to, at a certain level, make the United States more powerful on the global stage. And the third potential, as you mentioned, if Russia wins this war, there's a potential that Ukraine will cease to be an, a state. Or Russia could just move closer or occupy more land and just declare victory. And that's going to embolden a lot of the countries globally to try to find a solution through coercive means on the one hand. But then on the other hand, that's going to completely weaken the U.S. position in Western and Eastern Europe and further Western Europe. That's probably going to encourage some sort of isolation within the United States. Either way, I, from our perspective, I think this war has already bring a lot of destruction to the world. And none of those solutions, I mean, currently foreseeable solutions, is going to bring in a better world, let's say. And I think the best solution, of course, is both sides sit down and st start a negotiation immediately and reach a common ground and break the ice so that they can rebuild step by step and restore trust and security in Europe. That's going to take decades, of course, but I think if we can start from a good point and move forward with that, there's a still a potential we can restore Russia as a trustworthy power on the global stage at the same time and maintain Ukraine as a viable country. And also to China's, of course, best uh, hope to establish a multipolar world based on the current United Nations structure or a improved United Nations and prevent further happening of likely events in, around the world. Thank you. I think, of course, there's a lot that I want to follow up on there, but I do want to change the conversation now to look at how the Ukraine conflict has impacted China more directly. Maybe I'll start off at the very top. So from your perspective, how has the Ukraine conflict impacted China's relationship with what China views as the leading powers, particularly the United States, Europe, and Russia? Well, for China, the conflict really put China in a very difficult position because, as you know, before the war, European Union is China's number one market, and the United States is also a big trading partner. And also Russia has already become China's strategic partner, a very high-level strategic partner. So this war put our best market and our best friend at odds and fighting against each other. We're losing trust of the Europeans, and now Europe is talking about de-risking from China to a certain extent. So that is really hurting China's interest on the one hand. And then I think the weakening or continual fighting of Russia is also bringing a lot of problems between Russia and China, even though Russia and China is getting closer strategically. And further, I think because of this war, that's going to put China-U.S. relations deeper into this Cold War-like situation because the United States is, is worried about somehow China will replicate the Russia experience and try to maybe invade or even try to be more assertive its territorial claims and try to break down the current order in the Asia Pacific or in American sense in the Pacific. So I think this war is really testing China's diplomatic skills and also China's ties with the world. So far, I think China has done a pretty good job in managing those relationships. On the one hand, we have improved our relationship with Russia. Now we have better trade with Russia. Uh, many areas, particularly energy area, China is having a very good year trading with Russia. At the same time, we maintain our basic relationship with the European Union. All the countries are still trusting that China could do a better job in terms of bringing peace and mediating between the two sides after China successfully mediated between Saudi Arabia and Iran and try to bring peace in Myanmar and other cases in other parts of the world. So overall, I think other than China-US relations, it's still like in a different level. In terms of all the conflicting parties, China tried very hard to maintain a 
relatively balanced role and trying to reach out to all the other to all sides to you know find a common ground and bring a negotiated peace as soon back to Ukraine as soon as possible. In addition to China's relationship with leading powers, China has attached great importance to the global South. Would you say that one of the ways that China has made significant diplomatic inroads has been with the Global South since the Ukraine conflict? Yeah, I think in many ways, the Global South view this conflict differently from the West. Of course, from Europeans, they're looking at the conflict at their doorstep, and they're deeply worried and concerned about their future. And from the United States perspective, they're obligated to support NATO and to support Ukraine. But from the Global South, when they look at how this you know global order or this international order threatened by all the conflict they don't look at ukraine conflict they look back you know after the cold war when the united states taking unilateral actions without legitimate reasons to invade other countries so they're not really deeply sympathizing with what happened in europe when they have their own conflict that continues and that harms more people where the Europeans and the United States are really not taken care of or really focused on. So in many ways, when China is trying to have a balanced position, the whole global South also wanted to have a balanced position and have a more fair and more clear-eyed view of this current conflict. Of course, just like China, nobody in the global South want to see that this conflict continues because you know Ukraine is a major supplier of food to the global south and Russia is also a major supplier of energy mines and also food and all kinds of material to other countries and to to global south and that's why global south is very much agree with China to see the end of this conflict but on the other hand i think you know global south is really tired of the west this so called west central or western focused or Western centric view of the uh, international order. They want to see a more balanced, a more fair international order. And through this conflict, uh, they think that there's an opportunity, even though there's a silver lining that maybe after this, the West will see conflict differently and will have a more fair evaluation of what's happening in the global South and have more sympathy of the people in the global South. Thank you. I'd like to now transition to your views on what are major lessons learned for China from the Ukraine conflict. And I'd like to divide this into two different sections. Let's first look at how China views Russian and Ukrainian operations. And then let's discuss external support to Ukraine and external support to Russia. So starting from Russia, what is China learning from Russian operations? Well, I'm not a military expert, but from many of my Chinese friends, when they look at what happened in the first month of this conflict, what surprised them is that Russia did not achieve a very quick victory. I think the world expected Russia as a very strong military power would dominate the battlefield and prevail in a very short period of time. People are really surprised at seeing that the Ukrainians have waged a very effective counter-offensive using the military equipment provided by the West. And also this war is inter into a different uh, stage, a more futuristic level by using all kinds of modern weaponry, particularly drones. So I think China is you know, closely monitoring what's happening on the ground and realizing that in the future, the war would be very different than previous conflicts. The, but what from this you know superficial level, looking at what's really happening on the ground, other than drones, is that both sides is really entering into this trench warfare, and the artillery is mostly used used against each other. So I think ultimately, right now, what's determining the outcome of a battle or a tactical maneuver is determined by the number of personnel, military personnel, and the num- number of pieces of artillery and how many ammunition that can be supplied to each side. So this is, on the one hand, very much World War I-like, but then, on the other hand, very futuristic. It's a combination of modern technology and also the old technology. So I think there's a lot of lessons that we should learn from this current conflict. And in terms of what Russia has done to shield its economy, what, if anything, is China learning from that aspect of the war? <laughs> 
I think there's very little that we can learn from the Russian experience because Russia is not like China that is globally connected, and China is participating in this you know hyper globalization very deeply in terms of the division of labor, in terms of supply chain, in terms of technology transfer, and Russia on almost every level is much smaller economy and much less connected to the world. So to a certain extent, Russia is a fortress economically, even though there's tens of thousands of sanctions from the West thrown against Russia, there's limited effect on Russia's economy in the short run, even though in the long run, we believe it's going to hurt Russia's economy badly. But at this point, it's having a reverse effect of really reindustrializing Russia, particularly in terms of its military and its industrial sector. So I think overall, Russia can handle itself relatively well two years into the war, but China can learn very little from that particular case, again, because of China's global connection. And also, if you apply the same level of sanction against China, for instance, China's economy itself will be much worse than what Russia can perform. But at the same time, the global economy will collapse because how the global economy depends upon China's supply and Chinese market. So what I'm saying is that the level of interdependence is really different of China than Russia. So in the future, I think in terms of the economic consequence of, of the military action, that would be very different if you look at China and then look at Russia. And just to make sure I understand your last point, you said that if similar sanctions were to be applied towards China, China's economy will fare much worse than Russia's, but at the same time, the global economy will collapse. So it's much more negative for China than it has been for Russia, but also the negative consequences from your perspective will be felt more internationally. Yeah, it's the ultimately a lose-lose situation because Russia ultimately, prior to the war, is part of the European economy. So when you put sanction on Russia, Russia's economy has dented in the first year and then gradually recover. And uh, even though right after the conflict, European countries received this warning that they're going to run out of natural gas, they were going to have an energy shortage. But over the past two years, we saw a quick recovery and then the redirection of global energy supply to the European states. Europe, even though their price of energy rise to a very high extent and drove a certain deindustrialization in the heart of Europe, but overall speaking, Europe also withstand the impact of cutting ties with, Ru with Russia. So I think that effect in terms of its impact on global e economy is controllable. It can be sort of departmentalized in a certain area. However, if you look at the case of China from any perspective, from financial proportion, from supply chain, industrial capability, market size, and the Western companies' involvement, it's all 10, 20 times bigger than Russia. And so overall, I think it's unconceivable if there's a major conflict and there's some, you know, old, the same level of sanctions put on, on uh, China by Western countries. That's going to be really a loose-loose situation. It's going to bring everybody down. And given the high international cost of such sanctions, do you and most Chinese experts believe that there is a very low likelihood that these sanctions could be leveraged against China? Well, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's possible, but it's not desirable. What I'm saying is that unless the United States and uh, other major Western countries are determined to have a direct military conflict with China and try to cut all ties and move all their economic ties back to their own country and other countries, then I don't think that this is the road that they would take or they would choose down the path. And neither would China would like to see that outcome. But this is something that China is still quite worried about. Right. Just like people talk about Malacca, Singapore, if there's a conflict, if there's a war broke out, Chinese still worry about the United States, for instance, cut off the energy supply and other commercial shipping through the Malacca Strait. But I think nobody wants to see that because that's going to really freeze global trade and bring down the global economy. But when I talk to you know Singaporeans 
they're saying that that's a very low possibility. However, if there's a real war that could be done, now, I mean, still there's a potential that that supply chain, that major channel of it will be cut off. Thank you. What are your thoughts on what China is taking away from looking at how Ukraine has either operated in the conflict on the military side or Ukrainian actions on the political or economic front? I think the Ukrainians are doing extraordinarily well under the situation and giving the conditions. I think one of the things that Russia intelligence and Russian leaders missed probably is the will of resistance from the Ukrainian people. I think in this particular case, it's, it's quite obvious that the Ukrainians still has the will to continue to fight. And that is giving them enough strength to overcome the shortage of military supplies and the inferiority of their military to the Russians compared to the Russians. However, the problem is that still Ukraine is a much smaller state compared to Russia in terms of population, in terms of its current industrial power, and also in terms of its overall comprehensive national power to resist. So that's why it needs a lot of external support. But the problem is, so far in the past two years, it's very hard to, because they previously are all following and using Russian military doctrine, they're using Russian weapons, and now they're switching towards the Western weapons. And that brings a lot of uh, logistic problems to the country. So overall, I think under the situation, the Ukrainians are performing well. But in the long run, I think particularly when we go to a war of like five or even 10 years, that's going to diminish the reserve of this manpower and also bring total destruction of their agriculture, of their industry, of their urban centers. So it's going to be very, very difficult to recover from this. It's going to be cost a huge amount of money to rebuild Ukraine after the war. Thank you. So now let me turn to what you mentioned to be the significant external support for Ukraine during this conflict so far. As China watches U.S. and NATO activity in Ukraine, what are you taking away in terms of both the type of support as well as U.S. ability to provide that support? Well, I think it all comes to down to the U.S. willingness to provide that support because apparently the West still has a lot of potential to provide many more weapons and higher level of more sophisticated weapons to Ukraine. The problem, I think, is what's now stuck in U.S. Congress, whether or not the U.S. can achieve a consensus of providing more you know, financial military aid to Ukraine, and also not only providing them one time, but over the years, you know, for the next foreseeable future to continue fighting. And I think that's the only barrier. And after that, if the U.S. is determined to support Ukraine in the long run and also provide a very significant part of their military aid to Ukraine, then there's a possibility that the Ukraine can sustain the fighting for you know many years to come. But I think, again, to the very beginning, if Ukrainians continue, try to continue fighting, there's a, this danger of escalation because the Russians, when they saw that they're facing a higher level of resistance, they will up their game and put more weapons and personnel in the battleground. And then that will lead to the Ukrainians need more support from the West. So this escalation will ultimately lead to potential nuclear war and even a larger scale war. So that's what we worried about. And that's why I think even with massive support from the West, even with more munitions, more long range weapons, it's not desirable to see this conflict continue. You had mentioned earlier that you view the United States as indirectly involved in the Ukraine conflict. And we've also seen your institution write about the changing dynamics of proxy warfare. Could you discuss how you see that and how you view U.S. and NATO activities in Ukraine? In our new published paper, we described a new a proxy war as a avatar war. So that means an upgrade of the proxy war. It's not like what proxy war used to be in the Cold War, that the third party providing military assistance and some kind of a military direction to the fighting party. And now is because we're entering into a cyber warfare, a age of space, and also AI, 
And these new technologies are sustaining and supporting an, a form of asymmetric conflict that we men mentioned before and enabled the Ukrainian side and also uh, to a certain extent enabled Russian side to fight wars on multiple dimensions. And in order to fight that, however, NATO forces will get deeper into the command structure of the Ukrainian army, including intelligence, including providing information, providing communication, providing all kinds of technology support. So this means that, again, as I mentioned, this futuristic warfare that brings in a lot of elements into this war that will surprise the other side, but then the other side will adapt to the new reality and find ways to retaliate. And this is going back and forth and making this battlefield as a real experimental ground for new weapon systems and showing us the potential of the future warfare. The danger, of course, is that we've seen a lot of use of new use technologies on the battleground and also the use of AI. So that brings us to, I think, in the future of global governance, it's very important to try to control dual use items and also try to make sure that we understand the potential of using AI on the battleground. And also it's giving us this opportunity to really contemplate on the future of these new technologies and how human beings can take in control of all those technologies, preventing them from harming humanity and bring us a bigger and larger war. I know you mentioned avatar warfare and when we were looking at the Chinese literature, it was something that we had we saw had not yet been translated into English. And as you described it, it seems like it's a new concept of a much more evolved proxy war from your assessment of the US involvement. Is that a correct characterization of what, what makes it so different from other prior concepts? Well, the prior warfare is like, how to say, giving blood from one person to another. But this new concept is more like getting into another person's neural system. So basically, you're more deeply involved and integrated into other a person's like direction system so that you can have a deeper control of where they can deploy, how they will fight, and ultimately what they need to continue the fighting. So this is much more sophisticated Again, this is because of the technological involvement. That's why the U.S. Uh, now also evolved and adapted into this new form of warfare and also into this new level of providing assistance to the conflicting party. And is there Chinese concern that the United States could become involved in avatar warfare and areas or countries outside of Ukraine? Or is Ukraine what you may call the main experimental ground for this right now? I think the Ukraine is the main experimental battleground, but at the same time, the United States is using this experience, learning lessons from the battleground, and then apply that to other parts of the world, and particularly apply that in the Indo-Pacific theater. So now we're saying that the United States, through like uh, NDAA and other parts of not only legislation, but also you know governmental actions, trying to upgrade is support of Taiwanese military, you know, not only tightening its relations, the relations with Taiwanese military and intelligence, but also having a more direct interference into the region's operations, including training, including more equipment, and also more stockpile of precision munitions. So I think all those added up to a higher level of interference, a higher level of or modernize the proxy warfare. And just to make sure, do you see the Russians engaging in enhanced proxy warfare or avatar warfare, particularly given intensified U.S.-Russia competition globally? In other words, do you see avatar warfare as a way that Russia could operate in other regions outside of Ukraine? Russia has not a similar level of technological sophistication, so it's almost impossible for Russia to do the same thing in other regions. What Russia did is very different because they have Wagner. So they have a different level of mercenary or different level of non-state militant or, or military organizations in other countries, operating in other countries. So superficially, you will see 
a company like a private organization that is operating in other part of the world, but in reality, that private army is probably aligned with Moscow's international interest. So I think that's a very different, you can put that into some sort of green zone operations. And Russia also has the very sophisticated cyber capability. But I think that's very different from what United States has. U.S. has starting, U.S. has, you know, AI capability, and that requires a lot of technological backroom support and also drones and satellites. In that respect, I don't think Russia can compete with the United States. Great. Thank you. So in the interest of time, I'll ask one final question to wrap things up. So looking ahead, you had described what you see as major risks and how you see the conflict could evolve. But looking just at this year, 2024, how do you see the conflict evolving from April onwards? I think right now, Russia and uh, probably everybody else around the world is looking at uh, the United States election and who's going to be the next president in the White House. So Russia will keep one eye on the direction, future direction of the United States and the situation of the election in the United States. On the other hand, trying to leverage its current military advantage on the battleground. So they will try to push forward as far as deep as they can so that in the future negotiation, they can have more power to negotiate with Ukraine. But at the same time, they will leave some room for potential changes of administration in the United States. For instance, if Mr. Trump comes back to the White House and he wanted to stop a war and trying to negotiate with Russia, and then the Russians, of course, would like to settle with him because that's going to be better than settle with the Biden administration. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the Biden administration even has the will to try to negotiate with Putin in Moscow. So I think at this point, the battleground is deeply connected with the politics on the one hand, not just uh, in the United States, but also remember there's that's a big election year in Europe. There's European Parliament going to, through election, and there's multiple governments in Western Europe that will go through elections. So those political changes will have a lot of impacts on what's going to happen on the battleground. And if I think there's some sort of room for the Russians to seek a negotiated settlement, they will certainly go forward with it. And also, I think at the same time, the Ukrainians also looking at the situation in all those countries, and particularly in the United States, trying to unify the two parties for backing of uh, Ukrainians' request. But at this point, I think they have very little room to move forward. So I think it's going to get quite interesting on the battlefield and see how the two sides, the Ukrainians and Russians, try to use the current situation and play the domestic politics to their favor. Thank you so much, Professor Zhao. This is such a rich discussion covering a wide range of topics related to Russia and the conflict in Ukraine. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks again. 